Hey everybody! <laughs> Welcome to 2020's Women's Quarantine. <laughs> it was supposed to be a retreat, but we work with what God gives us and we know that he has a plan for our time together. I think it's funny that I built a, for the last year I've been trying to build a message around relationships. And yet when, and I was really looking forward to a time in a conference where we could dig in deep and get some conversations going and challenge each other's thinking and go beneath the soil and figure out ourselves. And yet then God decided that we are all going to self-isolate. And yet I can't imagine anybody who's so blessed to get to meet with every woman individually, one-on-one -on -one in their home. And so I know that God has um, using all of this for his purpose. And now you'll be digging in deeper with him and letting him cultivate the soil of your soul, plant seeds, and fertilize uh, the parts of you that are starving for connection. Um, the 1 Corinthians 3, 7 says that if we can do the watering and we can do the planting, but if he's the one that makes it grow. And so we're going to totally believe that that's what he's doing with this time. So I just wanted to explain kind of how it's set up. I'm going to talk a few times in between little videos that I made up of parts of my talk so that things stay interesting. The point of the videos and the point of the images that I'm tying with my words is for you to focus on the gifts that God has given us, which is kind of what I've done with them. In journaling, I have saved favorite moments of my life and conversations that I've had or words from songs or Bible verses. And then I've connected those two images in my life. And so I'm hoping that this video brings some of that for you to help you focus on the Lord and focus on what he's given you. Um, you'll see the idea of a garden compass, which is kind of the original title of the women's original retreat, which is now a quarantine. Hopefully through all of that, you'll focus your heart on worshiping the Lord. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce the first video right now. Thank you for being here. I'm ex so excited for our time together. My brothers and I used to dare each other to climb higher and higher into the tops of trees when we were too little to fear falling. Nowadays, when I escape to the woods, I think about hiking with my kids. My son would fly fish nearby while my daughter and I pretended magical worlds existed beneath moss-covered roots. She once made a snail an entire castle out of leaves. Watching her create a sanctuary for a snail's happiness still makes me smile. I was married under a hawthorn tree. The light beams dancing through the forest canopy still remind me of the magic in a moment. Those are my memories, but I'm using them to remind you of something. Picture with me autumn leaves twirling in the wind. Close your eyes and let the world fall away around you. Imagine. You're waiting beside a waterfall for an evening walk with the Creator, God Himself. You brought a flower with you, it smells like laughter, and you're super excited to show God a clover patch. There's a fern golly you can't wait to share with Him, but also something with scales that you need Him to know about. Yet, there's nothing you're afraid of, nothing holding you back. Can you imagine it? That person waiting by a waterfall, full of wonder for their God, still exists within you? Come back with me to an ancient story. The telling of this story began before there was any thought of a fallen world in Genesis 2. And I quote, God took the man and placed him in the garden, which he had created to cultivate and care for it. That one sentence tells us that before the idea of sin ever existed, Man's purpose was rooted in the cultivation and care of a living, growing, flourishing world. A world that needed to be cared for and cultivated by a gardener, by man. To remain a garden, to remain beautiful, it needed someone to care, someone to be paying attention. What I want us to see is that at the core of our beings, we are gardeners with the capacity to make the world a better place. The second thing we need to know about ourselves is that before the idea of a fallen world, God said it was not good for a man to be alone. We were made for relationships with the earth and with each other. 
C.S. Lewis is so clear on this when he says, we are born helpless. As soon as we are fully conscious, we discover loneliness. We need others physically, emotionally, and intellectually. We need them if we are to know anything, even ourselves. I was from a big family growing up, and I had people around me all the time, but I remember feeling very much alone. I know now that was a lie, but what everyone in this room has in common is we were children first, someone's child. And whether we had siblings or not, we first learned about friendship because of kindness, and that at some point we made a few enemies and discovered there were things we didn't even like about ourselves. It is a fallen world, isn't it? And relationships are not easy. For as much as I love nature, the truth is, there is nothing dependable about it. It can teach wonder and horror on the same day, as a tornado will shatter a blooming rose and a hundred-year-old tree in one breath of wind. So I'm not asking you to be naive about the world and pretend that troubles don't exist. But Sherlock Holmes said, the world is full of obvious things no one by chance ever notices. There is a longing, a deep hunger in all of us. And whether we try to push past it in our busy lives or hide from it in crowded spaces, on sleepless nights when we're paying attention, we long for connection, community, fellowship, true friendship. I shared with you my memories, hoping to awaken seeds planted within you to get you to pay attention. Memories are like seeds. We store them away or plant them in the soil of our lives. They can wait dormant for years and at times be encouraged to begin to grow for unpredictable or intentional reasons. I'm reminding you of the child's heart that beat within you before you lost the excitement you once had about the world. Deep within us, we know, we know there is something wrong with the world. Things shouldn't be this way. We long for a place that we've never been, a song that we've never heard, and we know something is missing because planted within us are the seeds of Eden, the place we were originally designed for, and the reason it's unforgettable, the reason the longing never fades is because the memory is a compass. God knew things would go the way they did. It wasn't a surprise. He knew we would wander and he let us go when we chose to part ways. Any relationship with us, his creation couldn't be forced or it wouldn't be worth having. Even today, he lets us make our own choices about which path to follow or about the soil of our hearts. Yet in the very purpose for which he created us, he planted a compass. He made us gardeners. The same flowers that drop seeds in the Garden of Eden will grow in the soil of your life. He still waits each evening for you in the hopes of your return. In, the time, in our time together, I'd like to help you find your compass. Okay, so hopefully from that little video, you got an idea of the garden compass that's been planted within you and it'll get you to start thinking about how your one-on-one -on -one time and alone time with the Lord is so valuable. It was valuable at the beginning of time, and since the fall, it's even more so valuable. And that image of God waiting for you to bring your laughter and the things you love about the world, like the flowers, but also for you to bring your fears and the things you're wondering about um, to Him. And hopefully that ignites something in you. But I know that that attempt may just frustrate some of you and you'll be thinking, I can't even find the remote for my TV and my house plants keep dying. So why am I worried about a garden? And um, 
that's okay. Even though I know there might be a few garden lovers present, we're not talking about gardens today. We are talking about God's original purpose for our lives and finding the meaning from it. And um, too often we focus on temporal things and it's the eternal things that really matter in our lives. And so we are trying to understand through a garden, which is temporary, the eternal meaning that God had planted in that. Um, at any point in time that you want to dig in deeper, they're attached to the website. There should be some handouts or uh, papers there for you to have lots more Bible verses that I didn't have time to read through the video, but you can dig in and ask some more personal questions and you can turn the soil of your own heart and you can see what, what seeds were planted in you and your, in your youth or how our roots are more deeply connected through those Bible verses and that's what I'm hoping all of this will come to. So I'm going to go ahead and, and start with the next little segment. I'm going to share a little bit of my own testimony in that and um, hopefully it'll lead us into our next segment. Thank you for being here. Any blessed part of the world where God saturates the soil and causes beautiful things to grow uh, begins to be cultivated on a person's knees. And so I do want to take time here to pray together over Ephesians 3. Lord, we kneel before you asking for changed hearts, for healed relationships and new beginnings, remembering that you are a gardener from whom everyone derives their purpose and meaning. We pray that out of your glorious riches that you would strengthen us with power through your spirit in the soil of our inner beings so that we can receive the heart of Christ and we pray that being rooted and established in the love that we may have power as a community of God's people to grasp how wide and long, high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled to all the fullness of God. Help us to recognize the gifts that we have to give to, for ourselves and for each other Give us new hearts that we will produce the fruits of God's Spirit. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we dare to ask or imagine. Amen. I would love for everyone at the end of our time together to come away understanding that they are still that they are gardeners, that we've been gardeners from the beginning of time, and that that is still the core of our purpose. Equipped, we are equipped not just to make the world a better place, but with the power to invite heaven to touch the earth in the places we live, work, and pray. To help everyone see that our lives are already connected to a garden, think about the following points with me. Use your imagination one more time. If you and I met and I mentioned that someone had roots deeply connected, if I asked you to share a time when your life was plowed under by tragedy or referred to a seed planted in a person's youth that flowered in their adult life, I know that we would find common ground and that is because gardening is kingdom language. I wanted to share a story with you about my dad. God changed the way that I saw him uh, because growing up I always thought that he was a coal miner. But then one day, God opened my eyes to see the depths of my dad's influence. Yes, he went to work every day beneath the ground, and in the darkness, he battled with the soil, and he cultivated it for his family's roots to go down deep, so that what he loved above the ground could flourish. The work he did was dirty, but it was invaluable. Like any other good parent, he pulled a few weeds but he also let his kids make mistakes and he helped us confront the thorns. What qualities are necessary in a good gardener? Think about that for a little bit. Because God gave me new eyes to see the gardener that was in my dad and through that, look at the whole world differently. Because we can't share stories here, take a moment and think about someone or remember someone who toiled to make your life flourish who planted beautiful things that were fruitful in your life who watered when you were in a desert 
weeded when a jungle had rooted around you or turn the soil of your soul so that you are not stagnant. Send that person a letter. Call them in this time of isolation and use it to embrace the people that have added so much value to your life. This is the first place where I would like you to use the garden compass that we are talking about. And I want you to point it towards your own heart now because you are the gardener of someone in your life. What kind of garden is growing around you? What have you been planting? In your panic? In your joy? What are you planting with your words? Is your garden more desert-like or jungle? In the Song of Solomons, a woman said it best when she said, My vineyard is mine to give. Your vineyard, your garden is yours to give. The most beautiful part of my life is God's story in it. I'd like to share a glimpse of that with you here. In the middle of winter, one year when I was growing up, a rose bush from our farm's garden sent up a single blooming rose. Like every other year in Pennsylvania, it had grown incrementally colder, a blizzard or two hit, and there was at least three feet of snow on the ground. To be honest, the bush that bloomed was terribly neglected, but a single stem had grown up into a storm window in our back porch and it kept its leaves. It grew a bud and bloomed with a rose as big as any you'd buy at a florist. It seemed magical even then, but the fact that I've never seen anything like it again in my life makes the memory that much more remarkable now. God knew the way to my heart was through winter because I love gardens. The rose woke me up like a compass. It pointed my heart toward his. Mind you, the rose died and nothing happened. I didn't fall in love with God overnight. I just began gathering the clues, following from a distance. Some treasures were tangible and I thank God for them like friends and flowers. Others were words spoken to me and discovered in books or songs. I tucked those ones into the journal and I would reread them when I felt lost. I used them though to chart a course towards the Lord. I do remember a distinct moment, a distinct verse when God offered me his heart though and the world changed. In Ezekiel 36, 26, God said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you and I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. The truth is my heart had been hardening gradually over time. I was a struggling farm kid and the Bible character I related to best was Lot's wife. Remember her? Yeah, she turned to a pillar of salt because she looked back. Like her, my focus was on what I had lost or lacked or never had and I was always looking back and I was letting regret sour my heart. My disappointments were self-inflicted because I was focused on the wrong things. The walls that I put up for self-defense just brought more isolation and my small world compacted in. My heart slowly and gradually was hardening to clay and forming in to stone. Think about this with me. So hopefully that has started to get you thinking about how things grow in clay or how seeds germinate and how well they do when they're scattered on top of stone, which is how my heart had been turning. In our next section, we are really gonna dive into relationships and the, how the dust of our hearts is formed in different ways and how when you mix those two things it affects your relationships both in good and bad ways. So many of us are longing for acceptance, for community and kindness, but like me when you're showing the world thorns it's hard to have a good relationship because people are afraid of those thorns. And in my situation I had yet to plant the garden and maybe that's what's going on in your life. So we're going to talk a little bit about first steps in planting a garden in our next section. Mm -hmm.